This week has been very powerful. The Holy Spirit has moved in a lot of beautiful ways. And I, I just want to say uh, and give praise and, and thanksgiving because you truly are in the house of God. This is truly a church. This is a church. This is like the real deal. This is the real church right here. This is the real church. I'm telling you right now. I have spent my life in churches. I spent my life 50 years of being in churches. I, I was in a church all up to Wednesday, Sunday through Wednesday, till I came here on Thursday. Now right here to Sunday. I'll do it again next week, next week, all year, all around, year after year after year. And I am telling you that if you stay in this church for a few years, that God will define you. He will find your destiny. He will give you your purpose. He will equip you. He will empower you. He will give you joy unspeakable. He will heal your family. He will save your family. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. He will teach you how to live for him, walk with him, serve him. And 30 years from now, you will still be burning bright with the fire of Almighty God. And then when you're 50, you will burn. And 60 and 70 and 80 and 90, all the way to 100 years old. And you'll be up there, I'm telling you right now, that the spirit of Jesus is upon me. And it's going to be powerful. No teeth, but glory to Jesus. So we are going right into the word this morning, which you're going to find in 1 Peter 1. And here's the, the thing that we're talking about. These are called the laws of possessing, the laws of possessing, the laws of possessing. Because you and I, just because we get saved doesn't mean that we actually have acquired everything that God wants us to have. You get saved and you've entered through the door. You belong to Jesus, but then there is a journey that you must take. And if you don't know what the journey is, you don't know how to take it, and you don't know what you're supposed to do, you can fail in your life, and you can misinterpret God. You can misinterpret the Bible. You can misinterpret what God is like, and you can misinterpret what his plan is and will is for your life because you're standing in a perspective that is not coming through the eyes of the Word of God. You're standing there in your own intellect, reasoning, and speculations, and you're seeing life from that point. And one thing you want to be careful is once you make a conclusion, you have released the harvest. And you have got to be very careful that every conclusion you make is based on the Word of God and the will of God, or else you're going to be eating from a harvest that does not come from God. It actually comes from the devil. And once you do that, you're going to have a problem with God, in God, through God, for God, and about God. And you don't want that to happen. So God has promised you a certain kind of life. It's called the promised life. And that promised life is not automatic. That life is called an inheritance. And here in 1 Peter it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance. Everybody say an inheritance. Say it out loud. I have an inheritance. It's the greatest inheritance there is. Say it out loud. It's the greatest inheritance it is. And it belongs to me. You see, here in the world, you are not equal based on what the world thinks about you as an individual. You may not be equal in your family. Your family may think you're a bum, you're a loser, you're no good, there's no hope for you. The world may think this or that about you. The people you meet, people at school, they may think you're nothing. Everybody may think whatever they want to think out there in the world because you're in the hands, clutches, and in the mouth of Satan. Satan's mouth is on you all day long. He's breathing on you and speaking to you constantly, telling you things that are not of God and trying to define you and create an identity for you that will not be able to function with God. Your identity broken, your identity wounded cannot function with God because God doesn't function with that. He creates you a new person. So when you get saved, the playing field of your life is all even now. Everything is even. You are equal with everybody. You're as powerful as everybody. Your inheritance is as big as anybody's, and you have the same available inheritance and potential. It's all there, bought 
by Jesus at Calvary for you so that you could enter into something that is far beyond you, too big for you, too amazing for you, that all you can do in your life is just give glory to God because everybody that sees you says, how did you become that when you were a drug dealer? What are you doing preaching up there like that when you were in jail the last time I saw you? Remember that God is not a respecter of persons, so he does not love one person above another person. And remember that there are no races in heaven. All races go to hell, so anyone of any color that thinks their color is better than another color, you're going to hell. You're going to burn in the fires of hell forever. No heaven for you. No heaven for you. Praise the Lord. So if we don't learn the laws of possessing what God has bought for us, we live our Christian life without our inheritance. You come to church, you listen to the sermon, you say that was good, but you go back and live like you're not saved. You talk like you're not saved, and you act like you're not saved. Why? You're not saved. <laughs> Salvation is not intellectual agreement with the Bible. Salvation is a conversion from one creature to another creature. You go from a worm to a butterfly. You go from a sinner to a saint. You go from a loser to a winner. You go from worthless to priceless. You go from defeated to champion. You go from nothing to amazing. You go from worthless and useless to incredible and powerful. Tell the person next to you, I don't know about you, but I'm incredible and amazing. Praise the Lord. Give somebody a high five and say, I want to tell you something. It looks to me like you have really lost some weight lately. You're so skinny right now in the spirit. In the spirit. Praise the Lord. Everybody together say, I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm rich. All the broke is gone. Say it. All the broke is gone. I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm entering my rich life. I'm entering my rich life. Say it a bunch of times. I'm entering my rich life, my wealth life, my blessing life. I've been poor long enough. Now I'm going to be full and overflowing. Well, these things cannot happen if you don't learn how to possess what has been bought for you and take it from position to possession. For example, you say, oh, I have everything. I have love. Really? Why do you hate everybody? <laughs> oh, I have all the joy you could ever have. Your own Prozac. <laughs> I have the peace of God. You're in therapy. So what I'm saying is, positionally, you can claim whatever you want, but until you possess it, own it, and make it yours, and control its identity within yourself, you don't have it. You just have it in the bank, but you don't know how to withdraw it. Let's learn how to withdraw this morning. Praise God. Go ahead and hug the person next to you and say, is that your original hair? It's amazing. Wow, move it around a little bit. Make sure it doesn't come off. <laughs> to an inheritance, everybody, that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by power and by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation. Ephesians 1.14, who is Jesus, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, listen to this, until we acquire possession of it. 
So why are there so many unusual Christians and so many different ones? Because a lot of Christians have just practiced how to act like a victorious Christian. They've just learned how to act like a joyful Christian. Because they watch people who actually have it and then mimic them. And everybody is deceived that they actually have what they're just pretending to have. They don't have possession of the inner treasures that God has bought them. So life begins as a journey. When you're born, you're born into a place called Egypt, and that's called the world. In Egypt, there's a pharaoh that's called the devil. And in Egypt, there are taskmasters that's your addictions and bad habits that won't turn loose of you. Also over there in Egypt, you have misery, bitterness, sorrow, and grief. That's how you know you're still in Egypt, even though you have the title of a Christian. So you have in the church, you have Egyptian Christians. The only thing you can be in Egypt ever is a slave. Nothing else. No slave can cross into the promised life or the promised land. No slave. There are no slaves allowed. You get out of out of Egypt by desperation, Exodus 2.23, and by eating all of Jesus, Exodus 12, 1 through 10. As you eat all of Jesus, it delivers you from Egypt. You go over to the wilderness, and in the wilderness, the first thing God did in Egypt is he took you out of Egypt, and under its power, he took you out. The second thing he does is he takes Egypt out of you because you brought Egypt in you, with you, and now he has to open you up and do surgery. So he comes over to you and he says, hey, Maria, I need to talk to you. You have a 40-foot 40 40 tongue. You're a big gossip and you're hurting a lot of people. Seven people were found dead in their living room with your tongue hanging out of their phone. So come here and let me cut it off. I'll make it about an inch. And then Maria says, Ah, Señor, por favor. I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet. I tell people what I think. I tell the truth. Praise the Lord. So God says, no, you're a gossip. Maria says, no. And God says, take another lap. So after 40 years of doing it, the body parts start to fall off, and they never make it to their promised life. You see, the wilderness is temporary. You've got to learn your lessons so that you can go in. No slave goes in. No patient goes in. Only warriors get to go in to the promised land. Holy warriors. Everybody say it, holy warriors. Lift your hands and say, I'm a holy warrior of almighty God. So because you still have Egypt and, and the wilderness on you, you mess up your life even though you're going to a godly church where there's an anointing. And so you have to learn how to possess things and remember that there are laws of possessing for acquiring what is already yours that God has given you. And these are the secrets that we are talking about. Ephesians 1.14 says that, that it is a, a, a possession, an inheritance that you have to acquire. Praise the Lord. And so Joshua 3.1 says, there still remains much more land for you to possess. Tell somebody next to you, that's what I'm talking about. I am going to take control over what belongs to me. When you're out of Egypt and out of the wilderness, you then approach the Jordan River, and that's called the promised land or the promised life. That is what God wants you to have, and it belongs to you. This is not a life of bondage or slavery or lack or weakness or defeat or a life where you have troubles and you don't know what to do, issues you don't know what to do. This is where you have authority. This is where you have power. This is where you have knowledge. This is where you have wisdom. This is where you have everything that you should have in God. Oh, Annalisa, why don't you stand up? Everybody stretch your hands over there to Annalisa, and we're going to minister to her 
this morning. Praise the Lord. Oh, I saw you diving right now in an ocean. It's very clear water and you're diving, but you don't have apparatuses like scuba gear. You don't have anything like that. You're just diving because God created you as a diver. You are to dive into God and discover all the mysteries of God. You then catch the mystery, bring it up to the surface, and let those on the top that cannot dive and cannot swim eat it. This will be part of your ministry. You will catch that which is beautiful. You will find that which is beautiful. You will then bring that which is beautiful to those that only see ugly. And your job is to make ugly lives beautiful. That is one of your giftings. You have seven giftings, but that is one of them and is a major gifting. As you live your life, serve God without condition, love Jesus totally, completely surrendered, and be totally under authority, not only in your words, but in your heart, completely. God says weapons will start shooting out of your body, and you will become a literal manufacturing factory of weapons, and little children will get weapons from you. Middle-aged people, adult, senior people, they'll get weapons from you because you are assigned by God to be a woman that destroys the enemy wherever you go. No enemy is to survive. You will become a very powerful preacher. You will become a prophetess in God. You will get powerful prophecies. You will have dreams and other things that will happen as God blesses you. 17 different anointings that are going to come upon you in your lifetime. You will marry the right person, have the right children children and be amazing and have a lot of money. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Tell everybody around you, my gosh, why can't he tell me stuff like that? What are the laws of possessing your promised life? Your promised life is amazing. It is a life where there are no curses. It is a life where there's no iniquity passed down to you by your DNA. You have defeated all the bad issues that your parents and great grandparents had, you have defeated those. You now are standing on holy ground and you're using the power of the Holy Spirit to do what God has called you to do. You're not a normal person anymore. You now go around making Jesus famous. The hypocrite you used to be is gone. The liar you used to be is gone. The fornicator you used to be is gone. The pornographer you used to be is gone. The person that feels sorry for themselves all the time is gone. The individual that doesn't know what they're going to do with their lives is gone. The person that's confused is gone. The person that deceives people is gone. The confronter, the manipulator, the controller, and the witch, and the warlock is gone. And all other words that may rhyme. Praise the Lord. So you get to the Jordan. This is the entryway, the door. And the word Jordan tells you the first key to enter in to your true promised life. And that is the word Jordan, and it means to descend into death. So the first step to entering into what God has for you is you've got to die to yourself. If you expect to have what God wants you to have, as a selfish person, you are not going to do that. And selfishness is the number one curse on mankind. We are so selfish, and because of that, we forfeit our divine inheritance. The Bible says the servant of all is the greatest of all. Serving requires selflessness. And so the first law of possessing you, you have to learn is how to prefer others before yourself. How to serve other people who don't appreciate it. How to love people who are not going to love you back. How to give to people that are trying to steal from you. How to pray for people that are gossiping about you. How to visit people that hate you and hate your family. How to send gifts to those that have that have told lies about you. This is called the selfless Christian life in imitation of Jesus. Any eye for an eye, you lose. Any, they treat me bad, I treat them bad, you lose. Anything he cussed me out, I threw the, the, you lose. Anything like that, you lose. You just get emptied. You become poor. You become poorer and poorer. And poor equals slavery. And you go right back to Egypt 
and you're under the power of your old chains again, and you become a resurrector of that which is cursed and that which is dead. Selflessness, then, is the first key. Dying to yourself and doing what God tells you to do. Say it out loud. I am going to obey when I don't want to. Wave your hands and say, that's what it is. I'm going to obey when I don't want to. This is the secret of crossing over from the wilderness and Egypt into the promised life. You begin by saying, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? How can I inconvenience myself to bring a blessing to you? Inconvenience, then, is the stairway to Christ-likeness. Hallelujah. So all of you that just want, 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 get, 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 gimme, 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 gimme. You see, selfish Christianity is cursed. When you serve God to get from God things, it curses you. But when you serve God to get things from God, to give things and bless people, it exalts you. You don't give money to get money. You give money to have money to give money. That's how that works. The selfish motive curses the fruit that you are searching for. Selflessness cures your fruit and purifies it. Turn to someone else and say, Ay, 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 hermano, estás predicando muy fuerte ahorita. Ayúdame, mi hermano, por favor. Yes, I am a Hispanic. Praise the Lord. It's my first language, and I love it. Ah. Second, look at someone. In Joshua 3, when the priests were crossing over to their promised life, their promised land, they had to take the ark with them. The ark of God represents the presence of God, the power of God, and the glory of God. When you walk with Jesus, you better make sure you're covered in the presence You better make sure you got the power and you make sure you're dwelling in the glory. The glory reveals God's face. The power removes the devil out of the way. And the presence gives you a good attitude. Everybody say hallelujah, praise God. Let's all say it together. I'm bringing the ark back to my house. Say I'm crossing the river with the presence of God as my power, my glory, and my presence in the name of Jesus. If you try to serve God without the presence, you fail. Because there are many areas of your life where you'll not be able to obey God because you are way too weak to do it. Some of you can't love certain people without God's help. You can't even bear to listen to them eat. Man, you eat like a horse. You're so loud. You get so impatient that you're not capable of tolerating imperfections. This is why you need the presence of God with you. That way, while they're driving you crazy, you don't feel crazy. You just smile and say, that used to drive me crazy. Praise the Lord. Deuteronomy 11.24, every place where your feet shall land will belong to you. Praise God. Every place where the feet of your feet land belongs to you. You see, you have to become an owner instead of a renter. Some of you just rent Jesus. You don't own him. He doesn't own you. You're just renting him on the weekend or whenever you're around Christians. This will not give you an inheritance. This will make you poor. What does it mean to own instead of rent? This is what it means. Not my will, but your will. Dear God, I don't do what I want. I don't think for myself. 
I actually let you think for me. I don't have my own opinion. I choose your opinion. This is being owned and this is owning. If you just rent Jesus, then what you do is act like a Christian when you're around Christians. And then the rest of your life, you do what you want. That's not discipleship. That's insaneship. You turn off the powers of God. You turn off the powers of God when you do not let God own you and you do not take possession of him in your life all day long. Raise your right hand and say, I need a lot of help. <laughs> all you husbands, put your hands on your wife. Just put your hand on your wife and let's sing her our song. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. Sing it to her. Don't sing it to me. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. One more time, hermanos. One more time. Look at your wife. Please don't take my sunshine away. Now move in, give her a big kiss, and tell her you love her. Kiss her face right off and say, wow. All right, you wives, put your hand on your husband. Just put your hand right there on his chest. I got something to tell you, brother. <laughs> give me some money, honey, honey. Give me some dough. Clap your hands. Give me some money, honey, honey. Give me some dough. Give me some money, honey, honey. Give me some dough. Whoa, 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 whoa. Give me some money, honey, honey. Give me some dough. The last verse. Send me to Hawaii, honey. Hallelujah. Send me to Hawaii, honey. Hallelujah, send me to Hawaii, honey. You don't have to go, send me to Hawaii, honey. Hallelujah. Wives, look at your husband and say, I know. I know, tell him, I know. Sing it to him, ladies. I know where you hide the money. I saw it over in the garage on Tuesday. I saw you put it in the washing machine on Monday. Then you moved it over to the car under the tire. I know, I know where all the money is. And I already took it. I'm going to Hawaii. What is your life like that you're living now? What things are in your world that you know don't belong there? What kind of pain do you have? What kind of fear do you have in your life? What kind of confusion is in your life? What is in your life that you know that's not the way God wants it to be? What kind of contention and strife and fighting and bickering is in your life? What kind of things are in your house that you know do not belong in heaven? Is there a little whiskey in there? A little weed? A little cocaine? A little heroin? Little pornography, little witchcraft. What is in your life that you know doesn't belong there, but you're having a hard time getting rid of it because you don't know how to possess the new inheritance that God is trying to give you because all God wants is to make you rich. All God wants is to make you rich. Tell somebody next to you, I'm not staying poor. I am going to be rich in Almighty God. In Galatians 6, 7, 8, and 9, you reap what you sow or what you feed grows and what you starve dies. 
If you want your inheritance, feed your faith. Feed your love. Feed your discipline. Feed your obedience. Feed your forgiveness. Feed your kindness. Feed your honesty. Feed your integrity. If you want the devil back, lie to everybody. Cuss everybody out. Throw the finger at a lot of people. Tell people to go jump in the holla holla and tell everybody you're a son of a motherless goat. Tell them whatever you want, but understand that whatever you feed is going to be empowered and grow strong in your life, and whatever you starve is exiting your life. It will die. That desire to hurt people, it will die one day. That desire to cry and feel sorry for yourself, it will die one day. That desire to tell everybody, get out of my life, that will die one day. If you just feed a little bit of love and friendship towards people you cannot stand. How are we doing? Hermanos, how are we doing? Come on, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's all right. You're going to be okay. Joshua 3.10. Four. I will drive out your enemies. Hivite, Hittite, Amalekite, Amorite, Girgashite, Parasite, and all the crazyites. Everybody said, God is driving them out. In your promised life, there's somebody in charge there already. You've got to kick them out with violent obedience and militant lifestyles based on the Word of God and the Bible. You've got to become a literal sniper for God. Because he said, I need you to drive out the giants that are in this land. Your life has giants in it. They're eating your grapes. They're eating your blessings. They're eating your money. They're eating the future of your children. They're eating your soul. And you've got to kick them out of your life. They're called giants for a reason. A giant starts out as a little parasite on the inside. As you feed him, he turns into a giant because of so much food that you have given him. Now it's time for you to cut the head off of the giants in your family. Everybody say, that's what I'm doing. Come on, tell somebody, that's what I, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm cutting heads off this year. Come on, pull your sword out and say, I'm cutting heads out. All the, everywhere the devil is, I'm cutting the head off right there. I'm cutting it. That devil was in my granddaddy. I'm cutting it off. It's not going to be in my children. It was in my life, but it ain't, ain't going to be there anymore. That demon of hell right there, I'm cutting the head off of that. We're not having that in this family. We're not walking like that, talking like that, or acting like that because that is of the devil. We're not partnering with our destruction. We're not partnering with our curse. We're not partnering with our poverty. We are partnering with our blessing. We are partnering with our inheritance, and we are going to take some heads off, some giants this year. Everybody say it. Giants are going down this year in my life. So Joshua, in Joshua 10, 24, found the five kings of the giants. He caught them, and then he hung them in front of everybody. Samuel cut Agag, the king of the giants, in pieces. David killed Goliath, a giant, and they all have meanings. Goliath means intimidator. Agag means to rage with violence. The five kings are the taste of venom in the mouth, twisted perspective, kings of terror, to wallow in uncleanness, and to kiss the face of emptiness. And they killed them all. 
It's your property. It belongs to you. It's your blessing. It belongs to your children. Will you sit on your holla holla and do nothing? Or will you rise up as a giant killer that you're supposed to be and say, we are well able to go into the land and take possession of it? This church is on the march, brothers and sisters, and it will not wait. It will not stop. It will not look back. This church is going in to the promised land that God has spoken to your pastor, and they are going to take city after city after city. By the thousands and thousands and thousands, they're going to get saved. They're going to get delivered. They're going to get baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they're going to get equipped and discipled because that is the promised life. If all you're going to do is come to this church on Sunday morning and not even bring your Bible and not learn anything or memorize anything or listen to God tell you anything, you're still under a curse. And you're going to pass that curse to those little children that you think you love. Do not tell them you love them while you're drinking. Do not tell those children you love them while you're using profanity in your house. Do not tell your children that you care about them when you're sleeping around with other women or other men. Do not tell them you love them. That is a lie of the devil. What you need to do if you love them, repent tonight. Repent right here and say, I'm done with the devil, I'm done serving the devil, and I'm headed for my promised life. Praise the Lord. Everybody wave your hand and say, this is for real. This is for real. God knows what he's doing. He knows how to do it. And he knows what you need to see so you can do it. Praise the Lord. And that's important. What I'm telling you is very important. Take it in. I gave you five out of 12, but that's all I have time to do. But I want each one of you that's here to remember, whatever your life is like right now, hermanos, whatever your life is like, brothers and sisters, it's probably not the one that God has planned for you yet. Praise God. When I look at you right here with a band, all I see is flowers all over you. You are a blooming, blossoming child of God. Don't believe anything else the devil tells you. You are a blooming, flourishing child of God. As you stay humble, and meek and enjoy the washing of people's feet Jesus will grow inside you and he will become so powerful that there's going to come a day when all you have to do is stand next to a depressed person and they'll start getting delivered you won't have to say anything you just stand there and the joy of God and the presence of God that's on you is literally going to jump on them just going to jump all over them the Lord's telling me to tell you this, Psalm 34, Psalm 37, 4. God will give you the desires of your heart that you've been asking him for in the last year. And they're very specific what you've been asking for. It's not like this or that. No, you've been asking for three very specific things. I can hear them right here. Some of them better not say. But I'm just saying, you're going to get that. In Psalm 145, verse 16, it says, If you'll open your hand, I'll fill it with all the dreams you've ever wanted. Psalm 91, verse 1 and 10, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. No evil shall befall you, and no diseases and plagues shall come near your family. Everybody say, I think I want that for myself. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Look at somebody around you and say, I think I want that for myself. 
God is amazing. You always freak me out every time you walk up. I mean, I know you need to do it, but you freak me. I'm like, I see a shadow coming. I'm like, wow. <laughs> but thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. I see some diabetes in this area. If you have it, diabetes, please stand up and let's get you healed. Praise the Lord quick right here. I can feel it. All of you stretch your hands out right in here, this diabetes section right here. And remember, that diabetes is a, a curse. It's not a blessing. Uh, change your diet. God will heal you that way. But also, let's believe God for a miracle to adjust your blood sugar levels right now. Stretch your hands out. And remember, if you don't want it, God won't give it to you. Praise the Lord. If you don't want it, God won't give it to you. But if you want it, God will give it to you right now. So we stretch our hands out and curse diabetes from your family tree because you've inherited this and it doesn't belong to you. So we curse it now and we command it to dry up and die in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Everybody say, it's going to die. It's going to die. Praise the Lord. Ma'am, ma'am, you're right there. Yeah, stand up. Stretch your hands out there. Hear the word of the Lord. All the enemies have been given their eviction notice. They must exit your family exit your life, and exit your body. I am now your guardian. I am now your doctor. I am now your policeman. I am now your protector. I am now your home. I am now your food. I am now your water, and I am now your life. I am now your healer, and I am now your peace. And that's it. Praise God. Everybody say that's it. Flowing in the things of the Holy Spirit are an act of love. Ministering to people, that's an act of love. And that's what we do. And that's what everyone should do. Praise the Lord. Brother here in the corner, second row. Second row. Yeah. Is that your wife with you? Why don't you all stand up for a bit, both of you. Praise the Lord. Hear my words to you. Have I ever failed you, saith the Lord? I will not fail you tomorrow. I will not fail you this year. I am coming. I am walking towards you. My hands are wide open. I am not going to reject you. You do not know how much I love you. You think I love you based on how you act. Can any father love his child like that? I love you because you are perfect in my eyes. And my love for you has no end. You've only tasted a drop. My daughter. I heal you of the hurt in your heart. I take out the broken-hearted expectations and I resurrect you, both of you, to a new beginning without any mistakes, brand new incorruptible, undefeatable, perfect, and beautiful. You lost your song, but starting tomorrow morning, your heart will start singing again. Wow. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. Say, Jesus. There's nobody like you. Come on. Say, Jesus. There's nobody like you. 
I can hear this. Miscarriages, I can hear it. You need to stand up if you've had a miscarriage. You also need to stand up if you've lost a child. And you need to let God touch you right now. Remember that your children are waiting for you in heaven. They're not gone. It's only temporary. If you want to have children but can't have children and you're legally married, I'd like you to come up here to the front. We're going to make sure you get pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have had so many couples get pregnant even after 15 and 20 years of trying. But for those of you that have had the miscarriages, please don't sit down. And those of you that have lost a child, I must tell you that the Lord has made it very real to me that your children are waiting for you. First, they're waiting for you to name them. They're waiting for you to name them. And you will name them when you get to heaven. I can't prove this from the Bible, but let your heart tell you if it witnesses with you. I feel the Lord made that clear to me. They're even waiting to grow up until you get there so you can watch them grow up. Because you see, God redeems time even when you think time is gone. You that want to have children, please know that no one wants you to have children more than God. So I prophesy over you that babies are coming. I prophesy over you that sons and daughters are coming to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I curse the unbelief that is based on fact, time, trying and failing. Do not listen to that. Listen to what I'm saying. And we declare that a baby will be born in the name of Jesus. We prophesy that babies will be born and we are not afraid because God's word is true. Turn around and face the people. Stretch your hands, your miracle hands out to those that are standing and those that are up here. Stretch your miracle hands out. Well over 100 to 200 people have received this miracle now. Everybody say it together in the name of Jesus. Get pregnant. Have several children. And freak out over it. And thank God for the rest of your lives. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, we bless you in the name of the Lord. Go be seated. And that's perfect. Keep that up, brother. That's perfect. Keep it up. Keep it up, brother. Keep doing that. Would you close your eyes with me? You know, I feel like the Lord is speaking to me about Allegra. That she has entered into something. Something something. Yes, Allegra. I feel like the Lord is to telling me that you've entered into something that is very divine. Like this is not something you could have done. Don't be ashamed of how amazing you're, you are going to become. Because you know that without Jesus, of course, but of course you're going to write so many songs and be so anointed. But there's an element of the prophetic. And, and the Lord told me this. I think I was in the car with your dad. And he said, all five of you daughters will write books, all of you. 
But you are going to have a medicine that's in that voice. You know, that voice is unique. That's a beautiful voice. It's very cool. But we add to you today the gift of miracles and healing in your voice so that when you sing, people will say, cancer left my body. I was blind in the side when I heard you singing. It popped open. I couldn't hear out of my left ear, and when you sang, my left ear popped open. And then that anointing is going to go to all the people on the worship teams, because there will be teams. And you are a gatherer of blessings and a distributor of mercy. And you are a seer. When you're up here singing, you'll have open visions from God. They'll become your sermons. They'll become your books. And they'll become, because there's a, your, your entire family has wings on it. Just wings. And there's just no limit to how far you guys are going to go. I'm so glad that I know this family that is so blessed. God bless you, Allegra. Bless you. Everybody say glory to God. Turn to somebody and say Jesus is amazing. I just don't want to stop, but I got to. But I don't want to because I got to go to the airport. But I love you. Close your eyes for a minute. Here we are in the holy place of God. We've heard the word of God. We've, we've sang in the presence of God. And for many of you that are here, it's a destiny night or morning. But you're also in a destiny church. And I want to ask you a very important question. Can you say that you're 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die? Can you actually say without lying and without doubt that if you died today that you would go straight to heaven? Because the greatest tragedy would be for you not to go to heaven. The greatest tragedy would be for you not to To make it to heaven because you were too proud to admit the truth or too embarrassed. God wants you to go to heaven and he wants to put the assurance that you're going to go to heaven in your heart. So if you're out there and you say, I want to go to heaven, I want to go to heaven, I want to have that assurance, I want to have that peace, I need it so bad. If that's you, and if you're honest with yourself, and especially if you're intelligent enough to make a wise choice, what I want to ask you to do right where you're sitting. And see, if you want God to do this for you, all I want you to do is to lift your hand right now, high enough for me to see, and then I'm going to pray for you, and God is going to do a miracle. Oh, my gosh. Look at all the hands, Lord. Look at all the hands, Lord. Please stand up right where you're at and let me pray for you. Stand up right there where you're at if you lifted your hand. Stand right there where you're at. And don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Would you all look at me? May I lead you in this prayer? May I have your permission? Would you wave your hand at me? Would you do this for me? Would you do this for me? Would you get out of your seat and just walk up here for a second and let me lead you in a prayer? I won't make you say anything. Come on up here. Give them a hand as they're coming. And they are publicly making a confession. They are publicly making a confession before God, 
before people and before the angels. Just walk up here and fill up this front. And I want you to clap like your mother's coming up here instead of some lazy way or something. Just pile in here. Just pile in here. Come on, celebrate their choice. Celebrate their decision. Celebrate their opportunity. People are continuing to come. Would the rest of you help me by stretching your hands out to anyone here that you know? And if you don't know someone, just pick someone. People are filling up here. We had about 79 in the first service. This is way, way more. But you know that souls matter to God? And they matter to Pastor Marco and the team here? Literally freaking me out. I just love how you're doing that. <laughs> that, that thing is probably looks, almost looks like a shotgun. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it up, bro. Now, when God forgives you, you know you don't deserve it. But if only, if the only thing God does is forgive you, some of you will still not be okay because you're going to know that God knows everything you've done. So what God does is he forgives you, and then he forgets. What are you ashamed of? because it's about to get erased. What makes you feel guilty? What did you do that makes you feel guilty because it's about to be erased from God's mind? You see, God doesn't want you carrying the past into the future. He doesn't want you remembering what you did. He wants those ugly memories, those ghosts, those demonic behaviors to never happen again because you are forgiven and God has forgotten. If you do not forgive yourself, you will stop this. You need to forgive yourself and you need to forgive the people that have damaged you. So let's all pray together. Can I be honest? I still think there's more people that should be up here. Why are you not coming up? I know this is a lot, but come on, get up. There's more of you that belong here. Come on. Why are you not coming up? Get, get up. There's more of you. Yeah, don't hesitate. Come on, don't hesitate. This is not a bad choice. This is a good choice. This is not stupid. This is smart. I mean, you have insurance on your house. If you don't have insurance, you flood, it's gone. It burns, it's gone. You got insurance, they build you a brand new one. This is insurance. Plus many other things. Come on. I'll wait for you. Come on, there's lots of you. This is this still not everybody. Come on, I'm waiting for you. Be smart. Come on, I'm waiting for a lot more people coming up. Line up the aisles there if you have to. Lots of people. I still feel there's more. But you know what? You want to just sit out there? That's between you and God. I wouldn't do it. I feel the presence of God. Come on, we got a third wave coming. Let's see that third wave coming. Come on, let's get that third wave of souls coming in here. Come on. Come on. Come on, let's get that third wave of souls. You matter. God has time for you. God will wait for you. There's nothing better to do than this. You're going to get to eat sooner or later. Now let's all pray together. All together. Everyone. Dear God in heaven, I repent. I turn my back on the devil and his plan for my life. I renounce Satan and his behavior in my life. And I accept Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. And I cast my doubts aside. I will not have them ever again. 
Now I forgive those that have damaged me. And I forgive myself. Now, oh God, wash me in the blood of Jesus. Clean me up, God. Equip me and empower me. And make me one of your disciples in the name of Jesus. I'm forgiven. My name is in the book. My doubts are destroyed. And I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven because the devil is a liar. Hallelujah. Turn around, everybody, and face the church. Turn around. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, here are the men and women that have been acquitted and are on their way to heaven. Glory to God. Before we leave, very important, those that came up in the aisles, don't leave. If you came up to get saved today and you're in the aisles today, we want you to do something very important. Your next step is Holy Warriors. Someone say Holy Warriors. If you're in the aisle, you're up here at the altar, please do not leave. There's something, you can pray with someone today, but we want you to get connected. If you didn't get a card in your hand, you can just open your phone and go to igotsaved.com. Just simply go to igotsaved.com, fill that out and sign up for Holy Warrior.